This program looks at how Bookmobile service developed over the years and how it established the foundation for all Hennepin County Library service. During the library system's early years, the Bookmobile led the way in furnishing library service throughout the county, fulfilling the mission of reaching those who did not have easy access to library services. Even before the county library system was officially created in 1922, service was provided to rural residents of the county thanks to a determined Gracia Countryman, librarian at Minneapolis Public Library. Somehow she found ways to provide books to the people, often delivering them herself in her own car. An enthusiastic motorist, she made the trips a lark, sharing meals with farm families, creating friendships, and spreading the gospel that people who want books must have them. In those earliest years, she was assisted by Nils Barlingtaug, the first in a line of remarkable bookmobile drivers. missionary like zeal, Minneapolis librarian Gracia Countryman continued to promote the need for the Hennepin County Commissioners to fund library services for rural residents. Finally, a tax was levied in 1921 for funding beginning in 1922. Former Hennepin County Library Director Helen Young recalls Countryman's leadership and her role in creating the Hennepin County Library. Miss Countryman, of course, had been the um, well, the founder, really, of the Hennepin County Library, she'd been the impetus behind it, and, and um, she was the one who had pressured Hennepin County commissioners to authorize the establishment of a library, and before, even before that, Minneapolis had been giving service to county residents for a long, long time, free service, and anybody, they could come into the library and use the facilities and use the books and so forth, but then she finally did pressure the commissioners, and she was a very forceful person. Um, and in 1921, I think that the board authorized it after the legislature had also passed the enabling legislation. The first official county bookmobile trip was in June 1922. With covered shelves on the outside, that first vehicle was called a book wagon. Librarian Countryman was aboard it on its maiden journey to the outlying community of Excelsior. It didn't take long to establish regular routes based on requests from residents, and the book wagon soon was visiting 115 places each month, including 80 schools. The book wagon carried about 500 books. Working aboard the book wagon was a challenge. I can just imagine going out to these <coughs> farmyards and the dust and the dirty roads and and uh, not very good insulation and <laughs> wouldn't be very much fun. During those years, Hennepin County Library occupied space in the Minneapolis Public Library at 10th Street and Hennepin Avenue South in downtown Minneapolis. Helen Young explains the relationship between the two library systems. There was a very close relationship between Minneapolis and Hennepin County. And uh, Miss Countryman, of course, was the librarian of the, and the director of the, or the, she was the librarian of Hennepin County as well as Minneapolis. And then she appointed the director. And, um, and really, she did, didn't have anything to do with the daily operation of the library. 
<laughs> but um, the staff, the two staffs were very close, very good friends. Everybody got along beautifully, no problems whatsoever. The first driver of the county book wagon was Francis Matson. Helen Young describes the recruitment of the first librarian, Josephine Cloud. She had been working in one of the departments in Minneapolis, and I don't know, I don't think she was really terribly 100% sold on having this position, but <clears throat> she was told it was her moral duty to take it. <laughs> In addition to Josephine Cloud, librarians who worked aboard the county book wagon in 1922 included Pearl Sabin and Pauline Field. The second year brought a 400% increase in book wagon circulation. Patrons were delighted with the service. They could request special books and count on the book wagon to deliver them. Books were eagerly loaned from neighbor to neighbor as well as from the book wagon to the individual. The only complaint seemed to be that reading books sometimes kept farm children from their chores. When librarian Pearl Sabin resigned in 1925, Gracia Countryman persuaded Ethel Berry to become Hennepin County librarian. Barry arrived back at headquarters after her first day on the job, wondering how she had been persuaded to give up the interesting job of organizing the library at the Minneapolis Journal newspaper to accept the crazy position at the county library at a lower salary. The fascination of the position soon won her over, however. Each farm family served during the early days of the county library had a real feeling of friendship for and devotion to the library. The family shared a lot more than a mutual interest in books with a friendly librarian and driver. They shared joys and sorrows, the arrival of a new baby, the return of a son from overseas duty, the recurring bouts with bad roads in the early spring breakups and the winter blizzards. They exchanged choice recipes and foods as they forged strong ties of loyalty. The book wagon, with its outside shelves, proved inadequate and was replaced in 1928 with a small walk-in type of truck, a Model T Ford. The following year was the stock market crash and the ensuing worldwide depression. Despite that and limited funding, the county library system was growing and serving more and more people. In the early 1930s, the years of depression laid a heavy hand on library services. The staff was overworked. Salaries and hours of service had to be cut. Not only were the libraries used overwhelmingly as the only source of free recreational material, 
but tax evaluation dropped, leading to lower budgets and consequently diminishing additions to the book collection. In 1932, the system's book collection totaled 70,000 volumes, and annual circulation was more than a half million. During these years, the Model T book truck also showed unmistakable signs of complete collapse. Somehow, funds for a replacement were managed, and a new Rio Speedwagon with shelving capacity for 1,000 volumes was put into service in 1934. By 1935, about 89 small rural schools were borrowing heavily from the book truck. As books were literally worn to shreds, the welcome help of a group of bookmenders in 1936 under the government WPA project proved a lifesaver to the dwindling book stock. It was estimated that WPA workers mended 10,000 books. Library staff were calling their vehicle a book truck. Driver Carl Hagen objected to the previous term used, book wagon, and librarian Ethel Berry thought bookmobile was too stylish for their equipment. In 1937, Gracia Countryman, at the age of 71, retired as Minneapolis Library Director. A Robbinsdale resident, she remained close to the Hennepin County Library, the fledgling system she had been so instrumental in establishing. The following year, in 1938, Helen Young joined the county library staff as the first assistant librarian under Ethel Berry. The next year, Olaf Jacobson was hired as bookmobile driver. I started March 1st, 1939, and uh, my salary was $65 a month, but my salary was that because it was this ordinary starting salary for that job would be $60 a month, but I had four years' experience shelving books in the Minneapolis Public Library from 1928 to 1932, so I didn't have to be trained in shelving. It was easier shelving books in the Hennepin County Library than it was in the city anyway. But, um, so I got five dollars more on the strength of that. But then about two years later, I was up to 125 when they wanted me to, the union wanted to come in and, and uh, unionize me. And Ms. Barry said, well, we don't, we've already talked about it. We don't have to have the union. Well, they wanted the union <laughs> anyway. It wasn't for you. This is for you. It's for the, whoever follows him. Working aboard the bookmobile continued to often be a physical challenge. Helen Young remembers an early journey in her career aboard the drafty Rio Speedwagon. I remember the day Olaf and I went out <clears throat> on what was called the rural school trip, which was my most unfavorite trip. And we used to go to, oh, 27, 37 schools in a day. It was ghastly. Little rural schools and, you know, way out in the country on these country bumpy roads, dusty in the summertime. But one day, it was the day that it was 33 below zero in Minneapolis. And for some reason, I, Olaf and I had just started. It wasn't very long. And um, I thought Miss Barry would say, well, it really is too cold to go out today. But she, I think, didn't want to, us to get the idea that this was a sissy job. So we didn't say anything, and she didn't say anything. <laughs> we went out. We got on a little country road, I don't know, it was miles, and outside of Osseo. The snow was extremely deep that winter, and we got stuck. And Olaf had to get out and shovel, and we had to back up about at least a half a mile to get off that road. And then we went back to Osseo, and we, I said, this is it, we're going home. <laughs> we got, and when we get to the schools, they were closed. But we kept going. We weren't going to give up and be sissies, you know. The one way, way out would have been, might have been open. And, um, so we got back to Osseo and we went into the hardware store and they had a great big pot belly stove. Oh, nothing ever felt so good because on the bookmobile we just had a little, just a regular little truck, little heater, the kind that you had in your, your cars, nothing else. And Olaf didn't have any, I had that in front of me. It was cold. <laughs> we were just congealed. <laughs> In establishing routes, the bookmobile staff always tried to accommodate requests for services. 
we had a basic route, uh, I suppose, to begin with. You know, when I came in, they were already established. But then people would say, well, so-and-so <coughs> over on County Road, so-and-so would like to have you stop there. And uh, so we would find out, how do you get to that person's house? And, or they would call up the, up the library and ask, you know, will the bookmobile stop? Or where can we meet it? Or something of that sort. It was, it was more or less by word of mouth and individual requests. Personal service and a genuine interest in people were trademarks of the bookmobile staff. Try to uh, be as friendly as you could with the people. And I didn't do a lot of reading. I just did a lot of talking. And we stopped right in front of their house, so if, if we uh, are in the, right in the farmyard, right up by the door, and if she had, and I would discharge all the books, I said, oh, you still have this or that out? Oh, it's under the bed. I better run and get it. And I um, kidded with the kids and made, called them different names, and, and uh, they would say, well, what did he call you today? And, and uh, then I would, uh, that would made the mothers, of course, relax them. They didn't have to be constantly hollering at the kids. And, but, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, sometimes uh, we come close to lunchtime and I say, well, what are we having for lunch today? Or The first record of bookmobile log books was in the late 1930s. The logs recorded trends in use and fascinating insights into the personalized way bookmobile staff linked people to books. But Miss Barry was, uh, she really uh, pushed trip logs. It didn't, it, you know, it, well, of course, Helen Young and Miss Barry were the only two that went on the bookmobile when I joined, and each one of them wrote on every day, wrote something about what happened. The Hennepin County Library Bookmobile Service had grown steadily throughout the 1930s and stood ready to face the challenges of the next decade. At the beginning of the 1940s, the United States had not yet entered World War II, but nevertheless, world turmoil was beginning to affect all aspects of American life. In May 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt proclaimed an unlimited emergency, and as the country shifted to a wartime economy, unemployment dissipated. By 1942, the United States was at war and Hennepin County Library staff struggled to keep library service intact. 
bookmobile schedules were curtailed due to gas and tire rationing. The number of trips, for example, was cut from 12 to 8 a month. The bookmobile reached some stations and schools only once in two months. A major change in reading habits occurred. There was great demand for books about the U.S., ally countries, enemy nations, and most of all, technical information for the men and women working in the war plants. Also requested frequently were materials on raising chickens, which families undertook when meat was rationed, information on victory gardens, and all kinds of cookbooks and how-to books. The bookmobile logbook, kept by the librarians on a daily basis throughout the 1940s, reflected wartime concerns, library cutbacks, and the close relationships of the bookmobile staff and their patrons. Dayton would like a later edition of the World Book for next fall has 1921 edition. Cold, clear day. Everyone talked about the war. Brought in victory books from everywhere. Three bags full from Wyzetta. Everyone's busy. Not much help available and much war work. Mrs. Blanche wants recipes without sugar. Navy planes were all over the air. One plane crashed several weeks ago in Mrs. Palmer's backyard. One man killed. Bright day, strong winds. Mrs. Beecher gave us some delicious spice cookies with lemon frosting. School 12 has a lot of flu. Heard all about the Mudge Boy and his exploits over Germany. Mrs. Jacobson's youngest boy is home from North Africa with a discharge, had malaria twice. Mrs. Edelman was house cleaning, waiting for Olaf to beat the rugs. Told us a story about a worm and a glass of whiskey. Despite the restrictions of the war, bookmobile service went forward and overall library use grew. In fact, the county, out of necessity, bought a new bookmobile in 1942 to replace the aging Rio Speedwagon. Bookmobile driver Olaf Jacobson recalls experiences with those sometimes cantankerous vehicles of that era. The 1942 Dodge cab over engine, the one that had the, the hood in order to, and just to lift up the hood, you had to take out 16, 16 screws on the other, outside of it to take the hood off. And uh, one time I was up at School 63 out of Hamel, and and uh, the, it was boiling over. I can tell you the reason now. I'll tell you that, the reason why it was boiling over, too. But um, I went to this farmhouse in the, right next door to the school, and finally got a screwdriver from the lady so I could get, a, get the hood off and then I had a, a wrench to get the, take the thermostat out. It wasn't that bad to take the thermostat out so it wouldn't boil over, but when the truck was built in 1942, it was built by Olson Body Company out in, uh, out in Blaisdell or when some, Blaisdell or whatever, on, um, in Lake, off of Lake Street. And apparently what they were doing was building this body with the with the cap off of the radiator. So sawdust was going into the radiator and plugging up the radiator, and then we'd always have problems until we finally got the radiator cleaned out. Then we would, um, and it was all right. The bookmobile logbook reflected the joy and relief as World War II came to an end. This is D-Day, much excitement. V-E Day, official proclamation at 8 a.m. Libraries, schools open, all stores closed. Miss Berry still has her cold. Cold, windy day after 81 degrees on Sunday. Regular blizzard during most of the day. Excelsior and Minnetonka, etc., all closed up. 
Nothing open but schools, and we're closing after programs. Mrs. Dominic says Phil is with General Patton's forces and is still fighting. Exciting news of Japanese surrender. Not official, but good and promising. Japanese surrender came at 6 p.m. Most exciting. Holiday for two days, August 15th and 16th. By the end of the war, the bookmobile was making 300 stops, many of those stops in the burgeoning suburbs that were beginning to surround Minneapolis. Those were busy days for the bookmobile staff, as indicated by these logbook entries. Two hellish days. Same old story of trying to serve too many people in places in too short a time. Our usual two terrible days. Cedar Avenue and Bloomington. More people, all of them nice, but too many of them. More dogs and dog fights and too many babies. When the men and women get time to read all the books they borrow from the truck, gets me. They all say, we can't get to the city. There's nothing to do, so we read. Olaf Jacobson talks about a typical day as a bookmobile driver. Well, we, uh, I get down to the library at 8 o'clock in the morning and get ready to load up and I had a lot of uh, reserves to bring down and school books. We had 85 rural schools to deliver to at that time and uh, 24 branches. We didn't take all our branches at the same time, but we, we didn't take all the schools at the same time either, but one school trip was 16, 16 trips, 16 uh, starting at St. Anthony over to uh, Osseo three miles north of Osseo. But then we would, the librarian would come down about nine o'clock and we would leave for the, and then we would just keep on going until we were done with the route. We'd stop for lunch, of course, and, and we would continue on until we went through. Sometimes it was three o'clock, sometimes it was five o'clock. The bookmobile staff always strove to provide library patrons with the materials they wanted, and they welcomed requests. Helen Young remembers that a slip of paper was used to record requests and that the checkout procedure was equally simple but effective. I think we just used little slips of paper and uh, had little pads and wrote them down and, and, and um, we had everybody's name in order as we got to their homes on the bookmobile and um, with a rubber band so we would just put the request in the front, in front of their name, and get it filled before the next time. And we had shelves <laughs> in the library for the bookmobile trips. And when they were filled, by the books got up there and were loaded for that particular trip. Helen Young also recalls how books for the system were ordered. Well, everybody had something to do with with the input about books being ordered, and um, I mean, although we did have a process, I guess, by which everything was covered, but. Um, at that time, uh, we ordered a lot of books from St. Paul Book and Stationery from local companies, and um, and then and from individual publishers because we had a lot of publishers who had representatives, Doubleday and um, well, many of them. <coughs> um, Bennett Surf was with whom. <laughs> uh, and you no, know, all these they had representatives, and the all the encyclopedia people had representatives who came to call on us. And I remember being so amazed at Ethel Berry because some salesman would come in, maybe I'd never seen him before, maybe once in my life, and she said, "Well, good day, Mr. So, and good good morning, Mr. So, and so, how are you?" And you know, I would just, how does she ever remember all those names? I found out how, how you do, do, do remember that, because I did too for a while. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, um, they would come in and, and bring their book lists and, and give you a fairly good discount for things of that sort. That's how we would order. But a lot of our things did come from local book dealers. The job of dealing with the new and growing demands for library service became the responsibility of Helen Young in 1947, when library director Ethel Berry retired. 
Ethel Berry had provided dedicated and inspired leadership for 22 years, with Helen Young serving as her assistant the last nine of those years. Helen Young remembers Ethel Berry. She was just a tremendous person. She loved to talk, and, and so she would tell, you know, Olaf and I heard stories like <laughs> going way back. To the era. That's why we knew as much as we did, because she was very good about telling us all kinds of things about people and about the um, earlier days in the library. And, and, um, um, and she was very generous. And she was terribly good to her staff. <laughs> and um, she was just a, a wonderful, warm person. And she was very smart, very bright. And, and she knew how to work with people, how to get the things that we really needed. Appointed to assist Helen Young was Margaret Cutler. The library system was facing major challenges, mostly because it was limited to a one mill tax levy, which was totally inadequate to fund a library system for a rapidly growing population. A prime example of the growing suburbs was the city of Richfield, which had increased more than tenfold in population from 1300 in 1930 to more than 17,000 by the end of the 1940s. The community was served only by the bookmobile that traveled from block to block, circulating hundreds of books to the mobs of residents who met it. In 1947, her first year as director, Helen Young lobbied at the legislature for an extra mill tax levy. I just decided we had to have more money. and. Um, I mean, there just wasn't any, <laughs> there were no two ways about it. And so I asked the, the uh, library board and finally went over to the county commissioners and asked if we could not have an increase from one to two mills, permissive legislation. And, um, well, nobody seemed to object to it, so we went over with a bill. <laughs> and that was when I learned a little bit about legislation. <clears throat> I sat over there hour on end, <laughs> waiting to catch different people, found out finally it was a man. Uh, we thought it was one of the counties around Minneapolis that was objecting, or that we would object, but it was not, apparently, and it was apparently this county up on the range, who, um, and it was Fred Cheena, I remember him very well. He was a delightful person, <laughs> I liked him, but I finally, you know, waylaid him and I said, Mr. Chena, why are you going to oppose this bill? Because really, you know, you're not even getting a tenth of one mil yet for the, for the range and, and we need it and it isn't going to affect you. You don't have to, you know, it's just permissive. And he sort of grinned and, and he said, okay. And so the bill went through beautifully. So we got, the, then the county commissioners, of course, had to be approached <laughs> and they did, um, they did approve it. Indeed, a last-minute qualifying clause had eliminated Hennepin County from levying the tax. Undaunted, Helen Young worked with the county commissioners and legislators to get the restrictive clause removed in 1949, thus paving the way for continued growth of the increasingly popular bookmobile service to the residents of suburban Hennepin County.